I uh, just kind of want to wrap up the previous lecture on turbulence and large eddy simulation. I want to go back to the filtering and um, I explained to you this, the, the idea of filtering as being like a sieve, right? Um, and you know, the sieve represents the grid and whatever the grid can, can catch is gonna be caught and whatever gets through, those are the subgrid. Um, so whatever the grid catches are the filtered quantities and whatever goes through the grid are the subgrid um, um, quantities that need to be modeled. But then um, when we looked at filtering, <coughs> I defined the filtering operation with this, with this tilde and I gave you some properties about the filter that the filter of a constant is still a constant, the filter it's linear, the filter of the sum um, is the sum of filters, commutes the differentiation. But one key property of filtering was that the filter of the subgrid is not, of, of the subgrid quantities is not equal to zero. Um, so, so if you go back to the sieve example, um, kind of breaks the sieve example a little bit. Um, this is the equivalent of taking another sieve and running the subgrid quantities on that other sieve. But you have to be careful that the other sieve um, is a different size from the first sieve. So it's not taking the first sieve again and running it on the subgrid quantities. They will go through otherwise. Uh, please leave it open. Uh, it's, it's a little bit warm uh, today. Okay. Now, we didn't define, uh, cont contrast that to the idea of averaging in, in, Reynolds, in Reynolds averaging, the average of the, f of the uh, uh, fluctuations is zero. Anyway, um, so I wanna show you the mathematical definition of the filter. Um, we never, we rarely compute this, except for when you're doing uh, like dynamics Magorinsky model, you're gonna do explicitly, you're gonna do a filtering operation, but in practice, we rarely do the, fil the explicit filtering in, in LES because we are computing the filtered quantity by definition. We're solving for it, so there's no need to do explicit filtering. But if you were given a signal and you wanna filter it because it's noisy or something is going on with it and you wanna filter it, this is a definition, one, this is the definition of a filter. It's essentially what's called a convolution integral of the original signal times some filter. This GX minus R, that's a filter, you can define filters any way you like. So a Gaussian filter, for example, if you've done image processing, there's Gaussian blur. That's, that's what it's doing. It's essentially applying um, a convolution that looks like this with G being a Gaussian um, function. And you have a bunch of other filters, but um, the, the standard filter on an LES grid is what's called the box filter. That's essentially whatever goes through your sieve, whatever s goes through the grid. Um, now, for simplicity, we write a filtered quantity rather than using the integral, we write it using this convolution symbol, the star. So when we say phi tilde, that's G convoluted with phi and that is equivalent to this integral. And the reason I'm doing this is I wanna prove to you mathematically that the filter of the subgrid quantities is not zero. So filtering subgrid quantities is not zero. So if we were to take the filter of phi prime, okay, what is phi prime? Is phi tilde minus phi, correct? Because phi is phi tilde plus phi prime. So phi prime is phi tilde minus phi. We gotta take the filter of that, okay? Now the filter, um, the filter of that quantity is G convoluted with phi tilde minus phi. And that commutes, so we get G star phi tilde minus G star phi. So that's G star phi tilde minus phi tilde, which is not equal to zero. Because G star phi tilde is applying another filter operation on the subgrid quantities. You can keep filtering and filtering and filtering until you get a, a, a constant value, I guess, okay? So here's an example um, of a box filter. Um, this is in, uh, what's, what you're seeing up here is a signal and what you're seeing down there is what's called the box filter. So think of just a Gaussian function that is running over um, a range of values on this signal and applying the convolution on that range. So what you see, we are going over that signal and filtering it. That's what the filter does, okay? So if you are apply this to the signal again, it's gonna clean it up one more time and then keep cleaning it up, but it's not zero. The filter of subgrid quantities is not zero, okay? 
And I showed you last time um, we went through these equations. Let me just skip. Um, so I put these guys ahead of time. We talked about the Smagorinsky model, and I showed you this simulation from Wasatch, my code. Um, showing the turbulent viscosity here, how it changes in space and time depending on the rate of um, strain tensor, right? Because we define the eddy viscosity in the Smagorinsky model as some constant times the square root of um, the, the, the magnitude of the, of the rate of strain tensor, okay? SIG, okay? And many, many more models. Now, what I added to these slides um, since last time so make sure you always, if you, you want to look at the slides, go back and download them again because they're, they're, be, they're being updated um, pretty much possibly on a daily basis. So to get the most recent, make sure you go and download um, the recent PDF. What I want to talk about is what we do with variable density and reacting flow. So I know some in the audience are interested in that. Um, so, so far we've, and historically through the, with the development of LES and RANS modeling, um, those were done on constant density and compressible flows. But they can also be done on variable density and or compressible flows, okay? Um, and the idea is to somehow incorporate the density, okay? So it gets a little bit, a little bit more complicated. Just the formalism is a little bit more complicated, but the, the essence is exactly the same, okay? So uh, let me explain to you how it's done for the reacting flow case where we are solving for rho u or density weighted quantities, rho phi, okay, rho is ch changes in time and space, we need to also in incorporate the effect of rho and its filtered value, okay? So what we do in that case, we apply what's called a Favre averaging or Favre filtering procedure. And that's essentially just a density weighted filter or a density weighted average. And what Favre did, he said, so I'm gonna swap nomenclature here, the bar, is a filter and the tilde is something else, okay? So what Favre said, we're gonna, we're gonna write the filter of rho phi to be equal to the filtered value of rho times some phi tilde, some quantity. So that's an exact identical, uh, th that's an exact mathematical expression, right? Because it's a definition. So what is phi tilde? Is rho phi over rho, right? So whatever phi tilde is, um, this allows us to separate rho and phi tilde so that we can divide them, right, and take them out from, from inside derivatives, et cetera. Um, and this applies equally to um, averaging and um, filtering. So for Reynolds, uh, for Favre averaging, this over bar is an average, is a time average, for example. For filtering, this is a convolution, okay? So this idea applies um, to both of these. Now I'm gonna discuss filtering specifically because you can do the, you can do the same derivation for um, the Rand's equations. So we do what we did last time. We're gonna apply this procedure to the start with the continuity equation. This is, uh, pardon me, the original continuity equation. Then we're gonna take its filter. So what we get is d rho bar by dt plus div rho u bar. So that's the filter. Now what is rho u bar? Is rho bar u tilde? Right? Whatever u tilde is, we're gonna end up solving for u tilde, and we're gonna end up solving for rho bar. Okay, so don't get confused by the definition. We just introduced that definition so that we can um, um, pipe it through the equations, and, and then we're gonna solve for those quantities, okay? So great, continuity equation doesn't change. Um, for the momentum equation, we're gonna uh, take it in its conservation form. So um, we have rho u over here, convective term, diffusive term. So sometimes you see me write the diffusive flux with minus div tau or plus div tau. You just have to account for a minus sign in tau, okay? So with this definition, tau is minus mu dui by dxj plus duj by dxj, okay? So don't get confused with that. Okay, minus grad p, and I incorporated um, gravitational effects because you have variable density, so you're gonna have some buoyancy going on, et cetera, okay? So let's take the filter of that equation. Um, so, because the filter commutes uh, with um, s addition, subtraction, and derivatives, it just applies to the all quantities within the derivative. So you can tell ahead of time what term, so, so previously the convective term was the problem, okay, so it's still gonna be a problem. But also over here, 
tau bar is going to be a problem because we want to solve, so tau is du by dx plus dui by dxj plus duj by dxi, but we are looking for u tilde, not u bar, right, because we want to be solving for u tilde. So we have also a little problem over here with diff tau, okay, and we're going to have to figure out how to get tilde quantities on tau. Make sense? Because we are solving for u tilde, okay? Um, okay, so we start with the time derivative. Essentially, that turns into rho bar u tilde, great. So, so in other words, we're solving for u, rho bar and u tilde, okay? So we need everything to be expressed in terms of rho bar times u tilde. And everything else is gonna be subgrid, really. Convective term, we're gonna deal with it in a second. Um, the diffusion term, we're gonna deal with it in a second. Rad P bar, well, who cares? You call it P bar, P build is a pressure, okay? And we're gonna get that from the projection or from the energy, from the um, equation of state coupled with the energy equation. And this guy, since G is constant, then this becomes rho bar G. So everything is accounted for except for these two terms, okay? So let's see how we can express those terms in terms of rho bar, products of rho bar and U tilde. Okay, all right, so we start with tau ij. Now, as I said, tau bar ij is essentially dui bar by dxj plus duj bar by dxi. But we, are, we don't know what u bar is, okay? We are solving for u tilde, so we wanna express it as a function of u tilde. So we do a fancy mathematical trick. We add and subtract a tau tilde, okay, which is a function of u tilde, right? And we call this guy, which is a form of subgrid stress or sub subgrid stress tensor, whatever you want to call it. We're going to show that this is actually insignificant um, in the grand scheme of things. And we're going to call, call this tau ijl. We don't know what this is, but we can compute tau tilde. We can compute it, right? Because we're solving for u tilde. It's part of the equations, okay? So we can compute this guy. This guy, you can call, call it tau ijl. Now we look at the um, advective flux. So this is u rho u. We're gonna write this, remember the Favre filtering, we're gonna write this as rho bar, so, so think of this as rho times a quantity, u u, okay, bar filter. So that's equal to rho bar times that quantity, all that quantity, u u tilde, okay? Just Favre filtering. Now, what we're gonna do, we're gonna add and subtract um, rho bar u tilde u tilde, just like we did above. So we added and subtracted rho bar u tilde u tilde so that we express the convective term that we don't know how to compute in terms of rho bar u tilde u tilde and some residual stress, okay? So that's essentially the difference between the, what we don't know and what we know, okay? And we're gonna call that subgrid. So we call this tau ijr. And once you do all of this, you get everything in terms of rho bar u tilde, u tilde, rho bar u tilde, tau ij tilde, p bar, so we're solving for all of these, and rho bar, rho bar g, and then we have these two, um, two, two tensors that we don't know how to account for, okay? So you can say, hey, you know, both of these tensors, I'm gonna model them as an eddy viscosity model, and we do as we did before. That's in practice what's done. Some people have dug deeper into this and showed that this, the di divergence of tau ijl is much smaller to the divergence of tau ijr because tau ijl actually came out from the diffusive fluxes, not the convective fluxes. And if we understand anything about turbulence, it's all the turbulence effects come up from the interaction of the advective terms. Um, um, there's a theory by Chandra Sekhar, a physicist, one of the greatest physicists after Einstein, um, on turbulence, lectures on turbulence. And he writes the momentum equations in frequency domain, in, in, so using Fourier series. And you can see that the convective term couples every frequency to every other frequency. So the product U, U, if you write U as a summation of Fourier series, that's multiplying each and every frequency with all the other frequencies. So it's an all-to-all -all coupling. And you know, these residual stresses coming 
from the advective terms, they have much more coupling than what's coming from the diffusive terms. So you could argue that this is much smaller. There's some evidence in these two papers that um, div tau ijl is much smaller than div tau, tau ijr, and we're going to neglect those. And then we say, hey, for tau ijr, we model it using eddy viscosity models. So we set that equal to mu t times du tilde i by dxj, et cetera. And then the purpose would be to find mu t. Again, so we we went back to the original equation. So nothing much has changed, OK? Now, scalar closure, um, and that touches on reacting flows and combustion. So with combustion, reacting flows, you're typically solving some model of your combustion, or you're transporting all sorts of species in um, your combustion mechanism. Yes? No? Why? No, tau ijr is modeled as an eddy viscosity as. Uh -huh. No, that has the molecular viscosity, right? Yeah, so that's, so in the end, you combine these two terms because they're going to look equal, and then you multiply tau by mu plus mu t. That's, so that's what it is about. That's where you start. You start from the end. You write the Navier-Stokes equations. You add an additional turbulent viscosity. You add a model to the turbulence viscosity, and you're done. That's how you compute turbulence. Okay. Scalar closure, an important piece of um, combustion and reacting flows. So we looked at solving standard transport equations in conservation form. Um, D rho phi. Phi could be temperature, energy, all sorts of species. Okay. Um, if, you're tr if you're doing PDF modeling, um, you can do that as well. Those are just scalars being transported, okay? Whatever, whatever law governs the quantity you're transporting, just take it and apply Favre filtering on it. So we're going to do the same. We're going to apply the Favre filter. So note here we have a diffusion coefficient, rho, gra rho gamma grad phi, and some source term. Now, most of the challenges are in the source term model modeling, uh, actually. Um, but this should give you a flavor of where to start, okay? So you didn't cover this in, uh, in the LES class. It's fairly simple and straightforward. You know how to do it, okay? Uh, again, we take the filter of the entire equation, and then we start with the time derivative. Rho, rho phi bar is rho bar phi tilde, okay? So again, we're solving for rho bar and phi tilde now, okay? We're going to be solving for rho bar and phi tilde. Rho bar is going to be obtained either from a, your continuity equation with an equation of state or some projection mechanism, whatever you're doing, if you're low Mach or fully compressible, that's where you get that from. Now, for the convective flux, we're going to do the same thing. Rho phi u bar is rho bar phi u tilt. That's the definition of the Favre filter. And then we add and subtract a phi tilt u tilt from this equation. So we get the same strategy, okay? We get a diffusive, a convective flux that we know how to compute. Remember, we're solving for u tilde, we're solving for phi tilde, and some residual flux, okay? That we don't know what that is. So we call that JTR, okay? Oh, why are we using the T if we have removed the T? All right, so this is JR coming from the um, convective flux. We're left with the diffusive flux. We do the same thing, rho gamma grad phi. Bar is rho bar gamma grad phi tilt. Okay. Now, one you need to we need to uh, to do one more thing here, and that is we we don't treat gamma as a tilt. Okay. We treat it as a bar because all properties are filtered, right? Rho, mu, uh, gamma, etc. So you have we didn't do gamma tilt grad phi tilt. We added and subtracted gamma bar grad phi tilt. Okay. In a way, it's like a gamma-weighted filter, okay? In the end, it really doesn't matter because you're going to call whatever is left as a another um, um, flux. That's a, a unresolved diffusive flux, div JTL, okay? And so this is what we get now. After filtering and splitting quantities, we know everything except for these two guys. We combine those into a single diffusive flux, 
subgrid flux, we call it JSGS. That's the sum of these two, and we write it in this form. So time derivative, we know ro we're computing rho bar phi tilde. We know u tilde from momentum, rho bar gamma bar. We may be solving an equation for gamma bar, or gamma bar could be a constant, or some um, um, procedure you can compute it from. If it's a constant, you just keep it as it is, and then you have this unknown subgrid scale, um, um, diffuse uh, sub subgrid scale total flux. Okay. Now we model the subgrid diffusive flux or the combo diffusive convective flux using the gradient diffusion hypothesis. That's the gradient diffusion hypothesis tells you that diffusion is essentially a gradient, and uh, you know just like Fourier's law for heat transfer. Okay, it's pretty similar to the eddy viscosity model, where you have the shear rate, the rate of strain tensor, right? So that's what it is. We say J S G S is rho bar times a turbulent diffusion coefficient times grad phi tilt. Okay, I'm gonna add a minus sign so that diffusion moves from high to low, and then you make sure you add a negative sign over here. So there's the same thing. Okay, so then we've boiled it down to modeling the turbulent viscosity. Now, how do we do that? The, it's pretty simple for most scalar uh, closure problems. We say we relate the turbulent diffusivity to the turbulent viscosity with the Schmidt number. But the caveat here is how do you get the Schmidt number? Typically, we run simulations with a preset Schmidt number, say Schmidt number 0.7 or 1, 0.5, okay? And that's how you relate. So we've computed the turbulent viscosity from the momentum closure, right? And once you have that, you can get the um, uh, turbulent diffusivity. And then your final equation just looks like the original equation, except you augment your molecular diffusion with um, a turbulent diffusion. That's it. That's how, in your code, all you have to do to add turbulence modeling is augment your diffusion or viscosity with a turbulent diffusion or a turbulent viscosity, and then compute that somewhere else in another function. Okay. Pretty cool. Okay. Now you know how to do LES with scalars. Okay. Okay. Here's a nice hierarchy of turbulence models. I was trying to reproduce the. Uh, I don't like getting graphs from other papers. It's kind of, I feel like, no, I, I inspire from other papers. I want to do it even better. Um, but this graphic was good enough, and it was so annoying to do the, all of these in, in Keynote. It's taking me an hour, so I just lifted it from um, this paper on, on uh, 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 ResearchGate or, or whatever. So anyways, it, it summarizes the hierarchy of turbulence models. You have Turbulence models, we looked at trans models, LES, and DNS. DNS is resolves everything. There's no modeling involved in LES, right? We resolve, ev in DNS, sorry. We resolve everything. In LES, uh, forget about D DES, so we have eddy viscosity models and dynamic models. We didn't talk about dynamic models, but it's essentially just eddy viscosity models. For Reynolds average Navier-Stokes, we had first order and second order models. So what was the difference? So remember, in the Reynolds, the Reynolds stress was a second order moment. It was the mean of u i u j prime prime. Okay, so that's a second order moment. So what do we mean by first order closure? So we're directly modeling that second order moment. Second order closure, we transport, we create transport equations for that second order moment, but we model the third order um, moments. Okay, U i prime, U j prime, U k prime. With first order models, we looked at zero equation, first one equation and two equation models. So the zero equation model just was the basic mixing length, L zero U, right? And so we had to find scales for L zero and U. And then um, with the one equation models, we found an equation for U, which was through the kinetic energy, right? We found a scale for U. It's all based on scale analysis, that the viscosity, the kinematic viscosity, or just the viscosity is, it, it, it can be written as a mixing length times a velocity scale, a length scale and a velocity scale. 
the length scale was the hardest to find. Okay, so we said for the zero equation models, if we knew the mixing lengths, we can get really good results, but in general, it's, it's really rough um, to get that. And the velocity scale, we modeled it uh, proportional to du by dy, to the, um, um, to the, to the shear. Okay? With the one equation models, we wrote an equation for uh, the kinetic energy. Okay, and from the kinetic energy, we got a velocity scale, which was the square root of the kinetic energy, right? With the two equation models, what did we do? We forgot about, we didn't, we, we, we did another scaling for the viscosity, and we related that to the kinetic energy and the dissipation rate. And those are better indicators of turbulence, because we can, we can uh, uh, describe turbulence based on the kinetic energy content of the eddies, and we can describe the size of the eddies based on their dissipation rates. Remember, small eddies dissipate faster than larger eddies. So the two equations, the standard one was the K epsilon model. You can have the K omega model. We have a bunch of variations on those. And finally, for second order models, we barely touched on that. Equations get really complicated. It's really hard um, to implement, rarely used. So this kind of model higher. Now, the future of turbulence, we, some are saying, lies in artificial intelligence. And the robots are going to fix the turbulence problem for us, the computers. We're going to fix the turbulence problem for us. And there were a few papers that came out. Machine learning methods for turbulence modeling in subsonic flows around airfoils, um, 2019. That's just um, fairly recent. Um, for the Journal of Fluid Mechanics, there was a focus on deep learning in fluid dynamics. This is a really nice paper. kind of gives an overview of what we can do with machine learning. Um, Julia Ling in Sandia, she's got a some really interesting work, machine learning for turbulence modeling. So there's classification of models, maybe finding the constants. You know, it's, it's a new world out there, using data, simulating data to come up with in-situ turbulence models. Um, those may be the best turbulence models. But in my opinion, relinqu relinquishing blind obsession with data um, can lead to very bad results. You've heard about this AI algorithm that was supposed to do hiring and ended up being a racist algorithm because it was based on the old data, you know, that was not good at the time. So there's a book uh, by this mathematician called Weapons of Math Destruction and how data can be used to actually cause to, to blindly you, if blindly used, you know, it can cause harm and disastrous effects. So don't be blindly obsessed with data. If the computer says so, it's probably wrong because you have more insight. I mean, it's probably right, but you don't forget the good old insight you can have, okay? Don't forget what your grandmother told you, the you know, proven ways of understanding life and reality. Don't forget those. Don't be blinded by data. It's great. It's a great tool. It's a great tool. It complements all of us. Okay? But don't be blinded by it. All right? Okay, some books and resources for you. Um, turbulence Modeling for CFD by Wilcox. Tenopi's First Course Course in Turbulence. Great book. Stephen Pope, Turbulence Flows, classic book. It's a little bit too mathematical. Um, you know, if you're not... Um, if you want to get the to the physics of turbulence, this is a great book by Tanaki Zen. Also, just you know, watching on YouTube, learning, um, hear, listening to people talk about turbulence. Okay, and the LES course um, by Jeremy Gibbs uh, in mechanical engineering, great course. Um, Jeremy is a great colleague colleague of mine. Um, he's in atmospheric and environmental modeling, so these guys they do understand turbulence quite well, large and small scale. Okay. So that concludes this lecture.